you again for Annenberg uh, Research Seminar. Our seminar today is sponsored by the Annenberg Network. Network. We're delighted to have as our guest today, Woody Powell from Stanford University. Uh, Woody is professor of education at uh, Stanford University and by courtesy appointment, a professor in six other departments as well. <laughs> Sociology, Org Behavior, Management Science and Engineering, Communication, and Public Policy. Uh, before he came to uh, Stanford, he had appointments at uh, Arizona, MIT, and Yale. And uh, he has received three honorary doctorates from Upsala University, uh, Helsinki School of Economics, and the Copenhagen Business School. And he's a foreign member of the Swedish Royal Academy of Sciences. The Swedes didn't like that. <laughs> <laughs> that was like my plumbing last night. <laughs> okay. Now, is there a tech person? No. I will not find them. No. 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 My laptop power supply seems to be emitting a huge amount of electrical magnetic When you plug it in, it makes about the Oh. 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 Do we have an experiment like that? Oh, Where does it run? You know, you could be another a kind of another uh, techno terrorist. <laughs> <laughs> you know, mess up speeches. Well, if he doesn't like anything you say, he's not going to neither markets nor a hierarchy, which uh, won a, a significant award, and of course the alternative of the networks. Mm -hmm. And uh, the one that I like really, really well but, and recommend to almost everybody is a piece that he published in the uh, American Journal of Sociology in 2005, entitled Network Dynamics and Field Evolution. And uh, it, it's really a fascinating piece because it looks at the evolution of the biotechnology field from its beginning essentially as a community, as a field, and looks at the various kinds of uh, different populations and the various multiple forms of relations that tie those all together and how they evolve over, I think you had 12 years worth of, worth of data. It's a really fascinating piece. In fact, that piece did win the uh, Zelizer uh, Award for the best uh, distinguished research paper uh, in the field of um, economic sociology. Very interesting piece. I think. I'm sure you'd enjoy it. Um, the piece, uh, what he's going to be talking about today, is an outgrowth of that work. Uh, it's from uh, a book that he's been working on with John Padgett from the University of Chicago. Uh, it's entitled The Emergence of Organizations and Markets. And he's going to talk to us about the ideas inherent in the uh, geographic uh, agglomeration of the life sciences industries, particularly the biotechnology industry. Woody, it's a pleasure to have you here. We're really delighted that you could come and visit us, and we're looking forward to it. Oh, you. Thank you. Would you join me in welcoming? Thank you. Thank you. thank you for the introduction. That paper that you described once had a great title. Um, called Practicing Polygamy with Good Taste. Uh, but sadly, the uh, journal decided that that was uh, inappropriate. Um, and it ended up with this horrific you know, network evolution and field dynamics with no texture or anything. Um, but Peter's right that uh, what we're going to talk about today is, um, in some sense, uh, a, a follow-on to that. John and I have been uh, working on this book uh, on emergence. Um, I'm going to give you a quick background to it and then jump into 
uh, uh, the talk, and the, the talk is fundamentally about why the clusters grow in some regions and not in others. Okay, so that's the idea behind it. Please feel free to ask questions along the way. I'm, I'm fine. I, I don't think of those interruptions. They're helpful. If you don't like it, I don't know about the computer thing, but you know, if, if you really object, I guess that's, that could be a thing. Um, so, uh, oh, and I should say, this is work um, with two former students, Kristen Whittington uh, from sociology at Stanford, Kelly Packard from management science at Stanford, and Jason Owen Smith. Um, and um, it's part of this, uh, this book, as, as Peter mentioned. So I'm doing a weird thing. I'm giving you the middle chapter in a trilogy. Um, there's three uh, pieces here. Um, the first is uh, very much a kind of social studies and science paper that takes uh, archival materials from the 1970s and 80s to, to study the lash up process by which a set of companies got formed um, throughout the US and, and in the UK. Um, and that chapter is concerned with sort of this assembly. What aspects of the academy got imported into companies? How did elements of the emerging venture capital industry get repurposed for the life sciences? So for example, coming up with something they call junior faculty stock, which was a way of vesting young scientists with a share of, um, of a company after it had an IPO, uh, with the idea that if in four years it would reach a certain level of accomplishment, and that would be something critical, kind of like tenure that was the equivalent. So the, the VCs thinking about how can we repurpose the tools we have into this um, new setting. Um, the second is the one I'm going to talk about today. Why did clusters develop in so few places? You know, from Sarah Palin's Alaska to Miami, from San Diego to Cambridge, UK, from Munich to uh, Singapore, governments, industry have tried to build life science-based clusters. And so few have happened, OK? Um, and what I'm going to do is today is take you back to the 1970s and 80s and show you what the candidates were in the US. Um, and then we're going to study and move forward. What's novel, I think, or what we think is unusual and fun about this work is we study failures. Okay? Almost everyone looks at successes, but we have pretty good network data on the failures. And you'll see from the way the networks catalyze over time that the striking thing, the takeaway, the push for you graduate students out there in one sense is you learn more by studying failure than you learn by success. The commonalities in this case from the things that didn't cohere and catalyze are much more striking than the commonalities among the successes. The successes prove to be enormously idiosyncratic and contingent. The failures look pretty similar. Okay, so there's in some sense a very important lesson. The last chapter, which um, is kind of the gearhead chapter, so those expecting really high tech kind of fun stuff, um, I apologize. Is uh, um, that's not what I'm presenting today because it's much more um, limited interest, I think, on some dimension, is looking at the evolution of the field to try to understand why over a 25 year period. A handful of organizations managed to stay central. We argue that imagery here is running faster to stay in place. Uh, that they're able to speed up and maintain their position by not social closure, but by social openness, continually inviting in new members, not because they were foresightful, in some sense, almost as a conservative strategy is the way they stayed on top is by being open to new entrants. And you see in the network structure in this chapter an elite, a second tier, kind of wannabe, not quite as connected as this internal core, and then the new entrants. What the elite that holds on does very well is never form alliances with the second tier, only follow alliances with the new entrants. And the second tier is left fighting among themselves, trying to claw their way in. But it's very hard to, the data show, it's very the sequence of network formation, very hard to move from that second tier into the first. OK, so the trilogy is a section in a book that um, the larger book focuses on these mechanisms of change in Genesis. Um, 
which we think about ideas of transposition and refunctionality. That's what that earlier chapter does. Various moves of incorporation and detachment, fusion and hybridity, immigration and homology. And what we'll talk about today, robust action and multivocality. And we try these ideas out in Renaissance Florence, the origin of stock markets in the Netherlands, transition from socialist to proto-capitalist economies, the work on uh, open source communities and IT, and then the biotech stuff I'm going to talk about today. OK, so the question, the sort of core question today is, what factors make distinctive network configurations possible at particular points in time? OK, so that's the question. That means we have to know some history. We have to study sequence. And we need to know a little bit about geography, about space. And how does a diverse collection of organizations, public, private, and nonprofit, come together to cohere into something called a field? Okay? Most people who study this work backwards. Okay? That's certainly what I did. So I don't want to be critical too much of that. But it's almost as if you're going to a play and you start with the second act and you try to figure out what the first act was. Okay? So what we try to do instead here, rather than a story that often turns out to be, think of most of this kind of work, my colleague Doug McAdam in the social movements area refers to a lot of this kind of work as slow journalism and when he's feeling particularly crotchety and, uh, and nasty. Um, what most of the work ends up doing is saying, well, this worked because it solved a particular problem or advanced some group's interests and in giving very kind of functional uh, accounts, which is what it looks like when you start as things have already developed pretty far along. So what we try to do in this is start when a field began at the virtue of having data from the very first period, and then try to look at why it succeeds only in a couple of places. All right. The core takeaway with it has to do with the character, I'm going to use a lot of network language, those of you who are not used to this, I apologize, I'll try to explain, of nodes, and I'll think organizations, how much those <coughs> nodes are open versus closed, the type of relationship, whether they're local within a geographic area or distant, we're going to argue that what can be transferred intellectually, scientifically, commercially, locally and distantly, openly and closed are very different. You know, look at the types of activities, arguing that some activities that are more upstream are like the first dance and uh, evenings uh, set a relationship. Those that are downstream are more like the last dance. The last dance has many fewer possibilities than the first. And we're going to look a bit at the sequence of five formation. Okay, so we have a lot of different sources of data, but the core question that, that we want to think about is. In the late 1970s and early 80s, a set of scientific breakthroughs were happening that were occurring in a handful of universities and research institutes around the world. They're happening in Paris at the Institute Pasteur. They're happening in Strasbourg at the Institute Chimney. They're happening in Cambridge, UK at the um, Molecular Research Center. Um, then the home earlier of, uh, of uh, Watson and Crick's work uh, 20 years earlier. They're happening in, um, uh, in Sweden at, uh, um, at the Karolinska. So definitely not unique to the US. And they're also going on in Geneva. Uh, in the US, the work was underway. Lynn Zucker at UCLA has shown roughly about 12 to 15 universities. So this wasn't the case that the intellectual horsepower was somehow just in Boston or the Bay Area, which is where we associate, in some sense, uh, biotech. Um, US public policy in the early 1980s was fundamentally behind the development of this industry. All kinds of legislation was passed to essentially say, take the stock of public science and commercialize it. You know, Congress, in fact, told universities, you're required to do that now with the passage of the Bible Act. All right. Um, so many regions in the US, I'll show you in a minute, had a very deep stock of endowments. All right. So lots of possibilities for where this could take off. Today, 50% of the companies, 50%, more than 50% of the employment, more than 50% of the patents, more than 50% of the publications, more than 50% of the pills, if you will, the treatments, come from just three places. 
Tyndall Square, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Bay Area, particularly South San Francisco and Emeryville. And south of here, Biotech Beach and Torrey Pines Road in San Diego. What a pronounced pattern of geographic concentration for an industry that's supposed to be global. Moreover, an industry, a field, that depends on two things, ideas and money. Your colleague, Manuel Castells, who I wish was here, because we could start arguing already about this, would argue that those are the two most fungible things. Well, ideas and money travel, they're rootless, they're able to, uh, to move around, and yet here's a case where the money and ideas seem to have not been global in the sense that we would expect. So our answer to this is two hinges on two things. Geographic propinquity turns out to be really important. Okay, this was not anticipated. This was not a initial founding condition, but it's something that became, through time, self-reinforcing and highly resilient. Okay, in a few places, the number of participants were attracted. I'm going to show you the common expectations developed to guide their interactions. And these legacies became sustained by shared cognitive beliefs in only a small number of places. Okay. Most places it didn't happen. All right, so here's what the biotech industry looked like in 1978. 30 companies. Okay, what do you see? Yeah. All over the place. Um, several places. West Coast, Texas, <laughs> Miami. Very strong East Coast presence, all right? And then the gap, you know, this is sort of like a Vasco da Gama map of Africa in which there dwelleth lions is essentially the story of the, uh, the U.S. hinterlands. Not much going on in the middle. Uh, but curiously, Memphis, Cincinnati, uh, Minneapolis were places where uh, the industry will fast forward just six years and we have 130. What do you see? Seems like it's spreading, more places, and what did I hear over here? Reinforcement. Yeah, and so bigger in the same. The, the, uh, you begin to see these self-reinforcing dynamics of Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, New York, New Jersey, Boston, uh, San Diego, Los Angeles, uh, and the Bay Area, but also a kind of smattering now. Ohio looks like it could be happening. All right, so those are, that's what's happening in 84. If you go and look, as we did, and collect the stock of intellectual capital for that period by looking at biomedical patents assigned to universities, hospitals, companies, research institutes by, um, uh, how do we do this, by zip codes and, and standard metropolitan area, this is the way it comes out. New York City and New Jersey are tied for first. Philadelphia's third, the Bay Area's fourth, Boston's fifth, and those are in the order of 3,000 plus patterns. <coughs> down to San Diego, which had 12 at the time, very, very modest. Each place had these potential endowments. Okay, let's take an example. Washington, D.C., home to the National Institute of Health, the largest funder of biomedical research, and Johns Hopkins Medical School, which receives the most funding of any medical school in the United States. Philadelphia, historically the cradle of pharmacy, where the industry developed in the late 19th century, early 20th. U Penn, a powerhouse in cancer research. The Wistar Institute, Fox Chase. So lots of possibilities there. <coughs> San Diego, a sleepy Navy town, a tourist town, but it had the stellar nonprofit institutes, no commercial world at all. Um, the university back in those days was just you know, barely 10, 12 years old, um, but it did have you know, some <coughs> capabilities. Still, if we were betting people, we probably would have said New York. This is an industry that doesn't need factories, it needs research labs. New York had the best research hospitals in the world. Sloan Kettering turns out to be one of the most active players in this industry. Rockefeller was a very powerful university in this area, Columbia, NYU as well. New Jersey was the home of the U.S. pharmaceutical industry. Princeton was active in this. So these would be our candidates. Here's what happened by 2002. Okay, a 
aside from the obvious, the three that swallow the rest, what happened in the rest of the country? <coughs> not a whole lot of growth and the spread. Spread's not there, but it's also the case, say, for the research triangle growing, the Bowash Cup Porter outside of Boston doesn't grow, it shrinks. And you'll see this in a little bit. And Los Angeles becomes dramatically in San Diego's uh, uh, shadow in this regard. Other places that seem like they might have been possibilities, Houston, Seattle, Atlanta, um, don't take off. Washington, D.C. doesn't take off. So it's not just that some triumph, others that were candidates shrunk. Okay, so that's what we want to try to understand. All right, so how did this form? This is an ugly slide. Yes, please. Just a question of understanding. What is the size of the dot? Oh, percentage? thank you. It might help to explain this. The, the size of the dot are the number of pri uh, publicly, public and private biotech companies within a region. So oh, it's independent of, of the revenue. I beg your pardon? Independent of the revenue. Independent of revenue. So Just it might be that a small here. one is bigger than all of the rest. Yes. No, it's totally, totally possible. And this is just a count. Okay. But remember, I said before that today, with employment, publications, patent, pills, any measure you want, more than 50% are just in these three regions. Okay. So this outcome is there. But the measure here, you're absolutely right. It's just, just the count variable. Yeah. Larry? Is that? No. Okay. Others? All right, please ask, because things like that are important to, uh, to get settled. All right, so I'm going to give you a story about why it happened in some rather than others. This is the um, big um, punchline story that I'm then going to try to illustrate through a series of uh, 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 network visualizations. So the first important part of the story is this idea of transposition, that there are, in a particular area, a diversity of organizations, multiple types, that's really a key feature, and an anchor tenant, okay, who plays a role in passing practices from one domain to another. All right, I'll explain what that means in a minute. But very important that this possibility of trying things in one domain, shifting them to another, and recombining them becomes huge. All right. So to do that, you need this variety of organizational forms, because what they represent is a soup, a rich soup into which different sets of rules and norms and practices can go in, all right, and create divergent criteria for evaluating success. Okay. Let me I'll jump ahead. I call this borrowing from uh, uh, from Ed Hutchins cognition in the wild. I'll give you an example. Um, let's see how you play it out. So an interviewer, Sally Smith Hughes, is talking to um, the uh, a scientist who is one of the co-founders of the biotech firm Genentech. Um, and she's uh, interviewing him and she said, the next step is the formation. How did this happen? How did this guy? Um, come uh, see you. And this is a legendary story that gets told that this budding venture capitalist, Swanson, came to see Boyer. Uh, Boyer was this famous scientist. They decided to work together, boom, okay? And there are bronze statues on the UCSF campus and marble statues on the Genentech campus celebrating this. And if you read stories today, you hear all these remarkable tales of their meeting. It ain't so. Okay, and both of them have repeated that it ain't so. Swanson was not a venture capitalist. He was a venture capitalist wannabe, living out of a Volkswagen on $400 a month. Um, he kept asking Kleiner Perkins for a job. They kept saying no. He was unemployed. He had about two months to go. Boyer was a brand newly tenured associate professor, scared to death that he might get involved in commercial activity that would cause trouble for him. And as it did, he ended up getting investigated by the faculty senate. But when asked how did Swanson contact him, 
he said, he took a list of names associated with the publicity of Asilomar. This was this meeting when scientists gathered at, at Pajaro Dunes to talk about should recombinant DNA work be done on monkeys. And there was huge fear. Today, we don't have this comparable fear. But if you look at the materials back from the 1970s, whenever you saw the double helix, like the New York Times or Time Magazine, right next to it was the mushroom cloud and the nuclear bomb. There was great fear that this was a dangerous technology. The mayor of Cambridge, Massachusetts, actually shut down all recombinant DNA work for a year for fear that Frankenstein would come out of the tap. Um, and so there was a lot of nervousness. The scientists gathered at a Silomar to talk about how to regulate themselves. And in fact, the most imminent at the time was the scientist Paul Berg, who agreed to stop his research on monkeys. Okay. And so he went through the list alphabetically, all right? Which means Boyer's no dummy. Paul Berg has turned him down. I'm chump change. I'm second on the list, okay? Um, I suppose uh, I was next on the list. It was a telephone introduction. He wanted to talk, so I had him come into my lab on Friday afternoon at a quarter to five. What does it mean when you tell someone to come to your lab <laughs> on a Friday at a quarter to five? So one version is don't stay long. What are other accounts? No one's going to see him come, so if it doesn't, yeah. it's reputation. I won't be tainted. Right. Very good. So there are two different, I'm going to get him out of here quick, or I might be interested, but I don't want anybody to see him. What else? He might not show up at all. Maybe he won't show up. I haven't heard that one before, so that one's new. He might show up afterwards. Ah. Nina has a Nina has an interesting question. Maybe, and Larry adds to it, maybe this is the start of a beautiful friendship. You know, <laughs> we have a long time. What else? Anybody from San Francisco in the room? It's really hard to park uh, in San Francisco. And at 4.45 on a Friday, that's brutal to do that to someone. Maybe this is a test of how serious they are. Okay. All I want you to think about here is how diverse the explanations are, all right? That's cognition in the wild. Multiple possibilities were pregnant in that situation. What could have been going on? Boyer certainly wasn't thinking, I'm going to get rich. In fact, he said, he was asked, was the technology ready to be commercialized? He had access to some money, and I thought it would be a good way to fund some postdocs to work in my laboratory. So what did Boyer do? with this prospect of money. Did he have Jaguars and wineries in Napa Valley on his mind? No, he, associate professor, how am I going to pay for my postdocs? This is, I can get grants, or this 26-year-old kid says he can give me money. Um, and early on, the first two years of existence of this purported famous company, it actually existed only at UCSF and at City of Hope Hospital in LA, where they tried proof of concept uh, research to see if it could go on. So what I want you to think about is what these forms allow is the mixing of different possibilities, OK? This isn't instrumental rationality. This is much more putting different pieces of things together, all right? Each region, each cluster needs an anchor tenant. <coughs> Use this idea for real estate economics but not the simple idea of an anchor as holding down you know, a shopping mall, but rather an anchor that protects the larger values of a community. And you'll see this in a minute. Um, and also in the successful places, it turns out the anchor is enabling. In the unsuccessful places, the anchor is an 800-pound gorilla and essentially says, play by my rules or not. In the places where that's not the case, the anchor allows multiple interpretations. Okay? So it's not just a story of diversity and connectivity. Those are important. Those are absolutely critical. But they're not sufficient. What has to flow through that diversity and connectivity are ideas switching around and moving and getting morphed and changed into different possibilities. So that, this is not just statistical reproduction but rather, in a real sense, transposition that status and experience in one domain gets imported into a different one. 
All right, let me, uh, let me move on. Okay, so data sources for this are um, a database built with um, dozens of wonderful grad students and postdocs over the years of all dedicated life science firms. It's a two-mode network, so the data are focused on the life science firms and their roughly 11,000 um, contractual relations with some more than 3,000 partners around the world. The partners of universities, venture capital firms, law firms, pharmaceutical firms, hospitals. You can see this. Uh, uh, you're tired of all this diversity. Um, and then backed up with interviews, field work, archival materials. Um, plenty of time spent in various office to make sure that uh, uh, the empirical work is, um, uh, is based on uh, good judgment about the field. Okay? We're going to visualize these networks using um, uh, PIAC, a, a software I'm sure most of you know, um, that uh, uh, is provided as a freeware by these wonderful uh, uh, Slovenian mathematicians. PIAC is Slovenian horse fighter. Um, and what the visualizations led us to is locate the tensile strength of relationships um, among a diversity of organizations in these different communities. Okay? And I'm just today going to give you the visualizations to try to understand it. I'm going to go very slowly with the first one, which is an old piece that uh, Jason Owen Smith and I did with Boston. It was probably for me the only aha moment I ever had, like a scientist, where a huge surprise took place. Um, and then I'm going to, once you get the handle of it, then I'll go quickly through the others. Okay? So the nice thing about PIAC is you can represent a hell of a lot in these pictures. All right? So the nodes. It's a little hard for you folks to see. Circles are dedicated biotech companies. Triangles are public research organizations. That would be Harvard, MIT, Dana-Farber Cancer Center, Massachusetts General Hospital. Squares are <coughs> venture capital firms. And diamonds are pharmaceutical companies. This is Boston in 1988. Not, there were no pharmaceutical companies there then. The type of relationship, remember I said, this image of first dance versus last dance is really important. R&D is an upstream relationship. It's the beginning of a, a research collaboration. It's red. Green is finance, the investment, either from a venture capitalist or another organization. Blue is commercialization, clinical trial, <coughs> joint manufacturing agreement, sales agreement. And purple is licensing, just selling, in some sense, intellectual property. If you had this data for only one year, these pictures wouldn't tell you a whole lot. You need it through time to understand how multiple affiliations shift through time. But our one year, 1988, this is a picture. Payak represents the isolates of the outer circle. So for some of you, remember the high school dances you used to go to. And you'd stand, some of us, the non-cool kids, would stand around the outside, and the cool kids would dance in the middle, OK? And there seemed to be a cluster or a clique dancing, and then a bunch of other people watching. Sometimes the outsiders would ally as sort of a rival clique. Sometimes they wouldn't. When we look at the biotech industry in Boston, in 1988 and represented, this is who's dancing. What do you notice from that picture? <coughs> who's at the center? This is a two-mo network, so the focus should over-represent commercial entities because that's our way to build the network, right? Who's at the center of that network? The striking thing is MIT, Tufts, New England Medical Center, Dana-Farber. Here are these private um, entities that are a big part of it. We move and extract the main component, the cluster that's most connected. Okay. <laughs> well, we talked about dancing, so now you got <laughs> So we extract the main component, the set of minimal connections among organizations that are linked to one another. I just turned myself off, it appears, when I dropped that. 
Janet, you got me a little worked up here. <laughs> All right. And when we do that, this main component allows us to reach 43% of the biotech companies. We then said, what happens if we take the public research universities out? The network completely dissolved. So part of the story we saw was in Boston, this industry was built the anchor for it for these public research organizations. Okay? And then we run forward in time to 1998, okay, a decade later, and what's going on in the Boston world? Many more participants at the dance, right? The interior of it's gotten vastly more crowded. One nice thing about our data, suddenly Harvard jumps in the game in 1993. Derek Bach, worried about MIT's growing centrality, decided to allow faculty to be involved in startup companies and put Harvard's endowment to work investing in these companies. So suddenly Harvard plays a very key role. But MIT say is very central. Before the dominant colors were red and purple, R&D and licensing, now we see much more green. So venture capitalists move to Boston, a very important part of the story. Most Europeans think take ideas, laws, venture capital stir, this will happen. In this case, there wasn't venture capital in Boston. It moved there afterwards, okay? We, we pull out the main component, you can now reach 71% of the organizations. You remove the PROs and it doesn't dissemble. So something's happened in Boston that the scientific anchor has in a sense passed the baton. Others have taken up the lead, more commercial entities, but the universities haven't retreated from the network, okay? So this is the part of the story, all right? So we thought we found the secret sauce. Wow, we're really smart. We have the story. We go out to the Bay. Oh, I could, I mean, in the interest of time, I'll, I won't cover this. But the important feature of Boston is universities play this role, not acting as capitalists or as entrepreneurs, but acting precisely like universities, okay? Generating ideas and doing high quality science. That's a really key takeaway, okay? So we said, well, let's replicate this and see how it looks the exact same in the Bay Area. Surely Berkeley and Stanford have the same role. And to our big shock, it didn't turn out that way. In fact, early on, Stanford and UCSF play a rather limited role. What happened in the Bay Area was these two companies, Genentech formed out of people from UCSF, Chiron formed out of people from UCSF and Berkeley, create companies that don't act like companies, that engage in open science, that strangely collaborate with one another and collaborate with other <coughs> companies. So they transposed academic values in the startup companies. And what's the biggest difference you notice in the comparisons? Much greater role for venture capital in the Bay Area. The anchor tenant in the Bay Area becomes these first generation companies and VCs who eventually pull in the universities much more involved. So my university that claims all this wonderful story about how entrepreneurial it is, and it was in the IT world, actually in the life sciences gets pulled in. UCSF deserves much more of the story as being one of, uh, <coughs> one of the founders. All right, so we go to San Diego. I'll do this quickly, I see the time is flying. Um, San Diego is such a puzzle um, in that it's a sleepy Navy town, a surfing town, a tourist town. Um, how in the world does it ever become um, uh, um, a biotech cluster? A scientist moves from Stanford, his first job to UCSD, um, begins working there, brings along his technician, and the two of them get together and begin to think that we're not going to become world-class scientists. It's just not going to happen. Um, I had this image, I'm going to cure cancer. I'm not going to be able to do it. But maybe I could create the reagents that hospitals and researchers around the world need for what they're doing, OK? All of the early reports where they were not thinking, this is how I get rich, but rather this could be my contribution. They go to try to find funding for it. 
And everyone says, no, this is impossible. You can't do it. You have to bleed cows. You have to bleed pigs. You cannot do this in the lab through a genetic engineering. He goes home one night, very frustrated, talks to his girlfriend, says, this is so, I only need about $200,000. And I've been turned down by the NIH. I've been turned down by Lilly. I've been turned down by Merck, turned down by Sherry Wow. And she said, well, Ivor, I never told you this, but before I dated you, I had a, um, a boyfriend. Uh, and he's one of those venture capitalists up in Palo Alto. He might be able to help you. Um, his name is Brooke Byers. Um, do you want me to call him? So, Royston's credit, he did not feel any jealousy. He goes, call, call, right? <laughs> so down comes uh, um, uh, Perk Perkins and Byers. They meet with them at the airport. They agree to give them uh, not 200, but $300,000, but say, you can't run this company. Byers is going to stay. So he gets his <laughs> later wife's old boyfriend as his CEO. Um, and what Byers focuses the company on is not developing new drugs, but developing these tests, okay? They're one of the first biotech companies to go public, a huge success. They get sold in 1986 to Eli Lilly, and it is a horrific misfit. Um, many people describe it as Animal House meets the Waltons. I think the, the more interesting one is Hybertech was full of young female scientists in their late 20s who described the challenge of having a PhD from Caltech or UC San Diego, working for a 58-year-old chemical engineer with an MA from Purdue. Uh, they said it was like working for your grandfather. Within one year, not a single Hypertech employee remained with Eli Lilly, okay? They all left, but they liked living in San Diego. They were exceedingly rich um, for that time. They did not move to Napa Valley or to Riverside County and try to start wineries. Most of them, we've interviewed a lot of them, transpose being rich with this is the largest NIH grant I'll ever get. Okay, I have this huge chunk of money. San Diego had no idea though how to commercialize startup companies. It created this Connect program um, and up and running you end up getting this, um, uh, this cluster that met regularly on Fridays for business lectures and for beer. And over time, this seeded uh, the San Diego area. If you look at the network, oh, this doesn't come out so well. These are the same pictures up above. Uh, there's an important piece I add now, number of firms. So this is the number of entities. In the perins are the number of local affiliations among them, okay? So we have 131 companies, or, or not companies, organizations in the cluster. 70 of them are connected. So part of what you see in the successful areas is this pattern of increasing <coughs> local connectivity that goes on. As the cluster grows, rather than becoming rivalrous, the participants become more linked to one another. Okay? So what's going on? Different types of organizations play this role. In Boston, the uh, anchor tenant of public research organizations. In the Bay Area, it was venture capital and UCSF. In San Diego, it was the spin-offs from, uh, uh, from Hypertech. But in all three, what ends up happening is extensive inter-organizational job mobility, okay, where people move across companies. Local competitors collaborate with one another. Public and private science gets interwoven for good or for evil, whatever your opinions are about it, what you see is a deep merger, integration of the two, but all independent of a hegemon. There is not a dominant organization in any one of the areas. They also, over time, this is working done with Kirsten Whittington, combine this dense local connectivity with very strong distant connectivity, but we'll hold off on that. All right, so. <coughs> We're not very good at being consultants. So no, it sounds like up to this point, all we can tell you is some mechanisms but, uh, and a set of factors that have to be present. But in each case, it seems deeply locally contingent. 
all right? Frustrating as could be for lessons for public policy, lessons for a broader kind of uh, uh, generalization. So let's look at the places that don't take off. And this is where I'm going to rapidly go through and try to give you the story of the other parts of the United States, OK? And the important thing to notice is they all start out with large numbers of organizations. The possibilities are there. Relatively modest internal connections. The numbers increase, but the internal connections don't. All right? And then the numbers decline, and the internal connectivity drops even further. Okay? So if we look at New York, well, many potential participants back in 1990, some early connectivity starts and then falls apart into separate clusters. What you see happening in New York ended up being rivalry among Sloan Kettering, Columbia, and another cluster, Regeneron, and, uh, and NYU. New Jersey, different. The very center of it is Merck, okay, the most connected local organization. Merck stays there, and it sort of fades and falls apart. Nothing catalyzes. Philadelphia grows. Nothing internally finally ends up almost like a face-off. You know, the three different groups at each other. We head south to uh, to Washington. There's an anchor tenant. It's the National Institute of Health. Um, it grows into some differentiated clusters. Never takes off. The research triangle grows somewhat, and as of 2002, maybe looks a bit like San Diego did way back in 1990. So, but still, not super internally connected. Houston doesn't really take off at all. Coming west, start in Seattle. Seattle is kind of interesting. The growth in numbers isn't that high, but it's certainly the case, particularly in the middle year, that there's a fair amount of internal cohesion. If you were to bet today on where a cluster might evolve, Seattle shows some possibilities. And LA is an interesting one. 35 organizations back then. The most important, of course, Amgen, the largest biotech company, one of the very first founded. Interestingly, physically, the founder from UCLA thought we will be equidistant between Caltech, UCLA, and Santa Barbara. So he picks Woodland Hills, <laughs> a nowhere land uh, where no community really formed around it. And part of what you see in LA is just it stays the same. Same number of organizations, but no increase in, uh, in local connectivity. Very quickly, this idea of anchor tenant versus 800-pound gorilla, what we do is think about the type of organization that's the most active player all right, in each of these time periods. So here are the three that took off. Blue is biotech firms. Gray is financial. Brown is uh, government. Yellow is pharmaceutical. Orange is uh, public research organizations. Look at Boston. It starts with universities. Universities pass the baton, in some sense, to financial institutions. Financial institutions pass the baton to biotech firms. Bay Area starts with finance, passes it to biotech. San Diego starts with PROs, passes it to biotech. New York, money, money, money. Philadelphia, pharma, pharma, pharma. Washington, government, government, government. Research triangle, university, university, university. Houston, a little bit of movement, but remember the numbers were very small. Seattle stays in the universities. LA starts university, stays with universities, moves a bit to, uh, to venture capital. Um, so part of the picture that you see in the places that don't take off, the most dominant partner remains dominant <coughs> through all this period. There's no transposition in terms of activities. I won't, in the interest of time, do that. Um, so all of the regions had considerable local endowments. Okay. So all 11 of these places have the possibility. But resources alone are not enough for the story. In each of the successful regions, what you had was what Rob Bird has characterized this. I don't like the language, but in some ways it's good. Sponsored collateral brokerage. To me, that seems more agentic than the story needs to be told. Uh, but rather, you had anchor tenants interested 
in pushing the activity and the science forward, not in keeping all the change in their pockets. Or anchor tenants not saying, this can move forward, but only if you play by my rules. When we've done similar analyses around the world, it's much, much stronger in the UK and Germany and Sweden that the anchors say there are a set of rules, everyone has to play by these rules, the rules don't change and evolve over time. You get this cross-network transposition that's really powerful in the Bay Area, commercial entities get formed but with the image of we're like scientists, so it is okay for rivalrous companies to actually work together on projects. Um, even though people told them not to do this, um, one of the key things that, uh, that helped for that was early on a handful of these companies allowed the scientists to publish in journals um, as a way both, this is the sort of cognition in the wild, of attracting human capital but also saying, if these things fail, they have to wait, find a way to get back to their old jobs. And the only way they can do this is by publishing. In all of the areas, save for Seattle, where the clusters didn't take off, the scientists weren't allowed to publish when they moved to the commercial um, domain. And in Seattle, Immunex, one of the most successful at publishing, once they were acquired by Amgen, the first rule that Amgen said is no publishing. Um, until you've patented first. Uh, so a very different rule. In other places, universities become active in commercialization. And then VCs become, in the San Diego example, CEOs. VCs become donors to universities and the serial founders. In each case, what you get is high rates of formation and disbanding. Uh, this paper got written up uh, last summer, or two summers ago, in an early draft by Atul Gawande in The New Yorker, and it's a, a treat and a curse <laughs> if that ever happens. The next day, there are all these phone calls from mayor's offices from around the US, <laughs> but the most amazing was from San Diego. And I have to, I'll finish with this story really quickly, because it was a total fun story. Um, I said, Professor Powell, you've made this, we like the attention you've given to San Diego, but there's a terrible mistake in your work. You say we have the highest rate of failure in the United States. <laughs> that can't be right. We're a successful cluster. And I said, you are a successful cluster, and your rate of failure is one of the reasons for your success. No, 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 that can't be. <laughs> that can't be. And I said, it is only through disbandings that you get formation. Oh, can't you call it something else? Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and we just go back and forth at this point that what the success and failure does is allow mixing from multiple domains, okay? Pulling in these reverse set of ideas and the places where it takes off the spillover to things as diverse as architecture and law are huge, okay? And so you end up with these abundant communities in which Economists now say, well, you have these agglomeration effects, okay? And they're very <coughs> real, these agglomeration effects, but they're the result of these mixing of different practices along the way. Um, real quick, just to anticipate questions, some of you might say, but isn't it just about money? Um, we try to figure out what are measures of money, so one of the things we've tried to do is look at the amount of federal grants that go to specific zip codes. Uh, green are these nascent or unsuccessful clusters. Blue are the successful. And you can see that Hopkins, Penn, um, University of Washington are right up there in terms of the amount of funding. And Hopkins dwarfs everyone in terms of the volume. So there is clearly abundant research funding in these different areas. And it continues. You know, MIT comes in 47th, doesn't even have a med school um, in terms of research funding from the NIH. Um, we try to think about it, is it the case that there's something, you know, think about this in terms of endogeneity, there's something in the water in California and in Boston that they're just more likely to do things relationally, okay? And here it turns out to be a really important insight in trying to study this. It's not the case that there's something distinctive, okay, to the Bay Area, to Boston, 
New York is deeply involved in relational activity. New Jersey is too. Philly less so. Less so. It's a tough city, let us say. Uh, Washington very much so. But in these <coughs> other places, the connections were external, outside. They wanted to be cosmopolitan from the start. Boston, the Bay Area, and San Diego started out locally. And the sequence that develops as local grows, external grows. And in fact, you become a sinner for the rest of the world to connect to you. In the other places, New York is external, New Jersey is external, Washington, DC is external. Those success come at the expense of local connections forming. Once you're a cosmopolitan center, it doesn't make much sense to try to build up this kind of local connection. There's clearly a sequence to, uh, to how these form. Um, maybe I'll stop with this. Uh, um, relational density and these multiple forms allow the possibility for different forms of evaluation, different types of evaluation that far exceed what any kind of entrepreneur or instrumental broker could ever imagine. Okay. And by having these cross-network transpositions, things evolve and take off in unanticipated ways, creating the possibility that status and energy from one domain flow into another. And that's the really important part of the story, having the chance that new cascades get formed, that new <coughs> organizing logics. And when you have these multi-connected networks with multiple heads, the failure of any one head is not likely to take out the whole network. So these densely anchored ones, diversely anchored ones, excuse me, are vastly more resilient to upturns and downturns. It's as if they can turn different types on and off depending on shifts and changes in the economy and government funding. So, it's one o'clock. I just got done by one. So, thank you.